I'd like to welcome you all to this um, wonderful opportunity to uh, hear a lecture that is uh, broad and uh, interesting and diverse, kind of like this audience. I have to tell you, from my perspective, looking out, there are people from the art side of the house and architecture, and we have a printmaker, and we have scientists, and it's a wonderfully uh, mixed bag. So thank you very much for coming. This is going to be fun. Um, our speaker today is uh, Daryl Butt, who's the Dean of the College of Mines and Earth Sciences. He holds a PhD in Material Science and Engineering from Penn State University, which he earned the hard way using a typewriter at times and developing photographs in a dark closet using a technology based on photographic film. Some of you know what that is. <laughs> He always dreamed of being an artist, but was encouraged in the latter part of his teens to get real and select a career that would actually pay his bills. <laughs> so I had a dad like that. So his interests and background are relatively diverse. Areas that, uh, research, that he's researched or at least dabbled intensely with include carbon dioxide sequest sequestration, materials and sensors for aerospace applications and extreme environments, nuclear weapons disarm dismantlement and international security, high temperature membranes and the production of liquid fuels from natural gas, preservation and reverse engineering of art and items of cultural heritage, um, and paintings and oils using materials that um, are fabricated via techniques of the old masters. So he's the author of approximately 250 publications and is a very active member in and fellow of the American Ceramic Society. I give you Daryl Butt. <laughs> Okay, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, when Randy and I were talking um, about getting together and talking about this topic, we were kind of interested in maybe um, developing some courses or getting some things going in conservation science. He said, why don't you come over and talk about it uh, at the library? And I thought we were going to meet at a conference room and just chat a little bit, but <laughs> it turned out to be a little bit more. So really happy to, to be here. and. Uh, Hope you enjoy this presentation. Um, so I'm a material scientist, and most of my um, presentations have a lot of micrographs and equations and that sort of thing. I'm going to avoid all that today. This is just going to be kind of fun. Um, and uh, I think I changed the title a little bit. So uh, it's called The Science of Art and Cultural Heritage. And there's a subtitle, which is An Approach to Education that Teaches Cultural and Scientific Agility. And I stole a little bit of this. Cultural agility is a term that Marianne Berzins kind of introduced me to recently. So I like that term as opposed to the term diversity and inclusion. Um, and I would like to acknowledge a couple of folks here. Um, uh, Glenn Gates from the Walters Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Anybody been to that museum? Just a couple. It's a phenomenal museum. If you ever get a chance, you should go and check it out. Um, but he's, uh, he's been, a, actually, I'll just say a mentor to me, and he also provides me with samples occasionally when I can get, uh, when I'm lucky. And I also would like to thank some folks that um, uh, helped me in other ways, my research group, many of the students that have uh, been involved in my courses that have worked on this. And also, I taught this, this is really a, um, about a class that I taught um, over a number of years, and um, it was kind of co-taught, so I had uh, faculty from various other departments that helped me out from art, art history, English, all over the place and on our campus. So it was a really diverse group that got together to kind of make this happen. Um, so anyway, I'd like to thank them as well. Um, a theme of this presentation is uh, the concept of transdisciplinarity, um, which is a word, believe it or not. And um, the whole idea of transdisciplinarity is, is breaking down the walls of academics. And so what I do is I, I try to get students together from various disciplines to work together and actually forget about what their discipline is. I don't care if you're an art student, you can work in the laboratory. If you're a scientist, you can go and work you know, at the library and do research from, say, Pliny the Elder. And, and so the whole idea is to just ignore the barriers of academics and the silos that we create in academics. So that's sort of an over, overarching theme of this presentation today. 
Um, and uh, when I first started teaching this course, this sort of hybrid course, uh, the university I was at previously had developed a new college uh, of, uh, of design, and they asked if I would teach a course, and, and um, I, I said that if I'm gonna do a course, I wanna do something really bizarre and, and unusual, and uh, I said, uh, that what I'd like to do is teach something on art. And they were like, art? What are you talking about? You're a material scientist. That makes no... Anyway, so I put this curriculum together and uh, I, I came up with a number of themes. And the themes were, uh, there were going to be four classes. The themes were um, the science, history, and psychology of color in art. And the first semester I taught that course, the entire semester was focused on the color purple, which sounds kind of crazy, but there's a lot to the color purple, it turns out. Um, and then the next course was archaeometry, methods in analyzing materials of art and culture. And this was more technical, focused on what are the tools that you use and that sort of thing. And then the third course was really kind of fun, case studies in forgery, preservation, interpretation of art and materials of cultural heritage. And then there's also um, uh, an internship program where students can go and get credit for doing interns at museums and things like that. Um, and I did have books that I used. Um, um, we kind of operated more like a book club than by giving reading assignments. So we would have a chapter, we'd get together, we'd talk about the chapter, that sort of thing. And these are pretty light books, and I have copies of them here. Um, Victoria Finley's book um, on color, which is fantastic. And I brought the books here just to pass them around. And this is Victoria Finley's book, and, and I'll, I'll pass that around if you're interested in it. And uh, if someone wants to steal that, I don't mind. No, um, just the, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, but the, the deal is, um, if, you, if, you, if you do keep it, you have to read it and then pass it on to someone else. Um, and then there's another book called Caveat Emptor, which is uh, about the life of a forger and his confessions. And he confessed and wrote this really great book um, after the statute of limitations had ran out. And it, it's, really, it's really pretty amazing. I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite books ever. Um, and then another book that I passed around, which is um, uh, a broader overarching book, which is called Blind Spot. Um, I pass this around on campus quite a bit, and I'm betting many of you have read it. And it really is about overcoming our, our biases. And again, you're welcome to keep that book if you want to. Um, if you don't, that's fine. Um, but uh, someone in the audience gets to keep it, I suppose, so that's fine. Um, so anyway, those are some of the books we used. And um, the whole idea of this class is, is, to, uh, is to set up a problem that is, is so fun and so um, uh, sort of interesting to the students that they're, they're just compelled to work on it. Um, and, uh, and so I had all kinds of interesting projects, and these are just a handful of them. So um, we worked on Renaissance paintings. We worked on a pioneer newspaper that was supposed to be the first edition of a pioneer newspaper in Idaho, and we proved that it wasn't. Um, we worked on daguerreotype photographs and tried to understand their degradation. Uh, we worked on uh, Native American artifacts, trying to uh, understand signatures associated with the chemistry of obsidians so that we could um, uh, identify materials in the field without moving them, um, that sort of thing. We also worked on a a human skull that was pre-Columbian that had been painted with cinnabar, which is a, uh, a rather unusual pigment to find on a, on a skull. And we tried to understand its, uh, its um, provenience so that it could be repatriated, so it could be given back to a, uh, a group of Native Americans to be most likely put back into the ground. And uh, my funnest project actually is uh, we worked on a, a mummy portrait for several years and uh, these uh, I interesting portraits, I'll come back to this later, uh, were painted in, in Egypt um, from somewhere around uh, 100 BC to 200 AD. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one towards the end uh, to kind of emphasize um, this transdisciplinary type of research. Plus it's Halloween, so I figured, you know, let's talk about mummies a little bit. Um, so let me start here. Um, this is actually how I started my first class when I taught this. And um, I started it this way. I said, so butterflies see the color purple really well. And then there was this long moment of silence and the students thought I was crazy. Um, so the, the reason I say this is because, you know, we, see, we all see the world differently. And, um, and butterflies uh, actually, I don't know how they figured this out, but butterflies see um, in the color range somewhere, from somewhere around 580 nanometers um, beyond violet into the ultraviolet range. So their visible spectrum is very different than ours. Um, 
And uh, in fact, if you take a white butterfly, if you catch a white butterfly uh, and go into a closet with it or a dark room and shine a, a ultraviolet light on it, um, it will actually often reveal a rather exotic pattern. So what appears to us to be a white butterfly appears to be very exotic and perhaps attractive to a butterfly. Uh, so they see the world very differently. And, uh, and so that's you know, kind of what I do, is I try to understand um, things by shining light on them. Let's put it that way. So if, if a butterfly, for example, looked at a flower, um, they might see it with a different kind of information than we see it. Um, and uh, in my field, I use primarily uh, electrons and photons to shine light on things and look at them in different ways. So when I look at an object, a material for example, um, I have a perception of what that material is, but if I shine electrons and photons or other, other uh, types of uh, waves or particles on that um, object, um, I'll get information back and I can learn about the chemistry and I can learn about the, the, the structure of the material and those sorts of things. Um, in my field, um, I tend to use things like synchrotron radiation. So this is a kind of a beautiful picture of a synchrotron in France. And a synchrotron basically is this gigantic analytical tool where electrons run around this building uh, or this facility and because of their curvature, uh, they produce um, what are called bright x-rays. And we can use those bright x-rays to do all sorts of things. Bright x-rays are a very powerful tool. And so when you go to a synchrotron facility, what you'll find is there are little stations at the end of these beam lines where you can do fantastic work. And it turns out synchrotron radiation is a really great way to look at art um, as well as biological materials uh, and medical materials. Um, I also use electron, be uh, electron sources for looking at things uh, uh, sort of like a microscope. This is a transmission electron microscope. Uh, we do scanning electron microscopes microscopy as well. We also use ions to sputter things and, and look at the ions that come off. This is a technique called um, secondary ion mass spectroscopy that we use a great deal. Um, and we also use very simple devices like handheld devices and this is an example of an x-ray fluorescence system and here we've got an individual looking at, a, uh, at one of Monk's uh, famous uh, uh, paintings called The Scream and I might talk about that a little bit later if I have time. And this is looking at a Jackson Pollock painting for some reason. I don't really get Jackson Pollock, but um, <laughs> anyway. So transdisciplinarity, okay? So um, this is uh, an image. You guys know who this is, right? Who is this? I mean, the name's at the top, right? So I've already biased you, but you recognize him as this is Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and uh, fairly famous guy, as you know. Um, and if there's anybody that's transdisciplinary, this is, this is a great model. Um, so he was, he was an artist, he was an engineer. Um, I wouldn't say he was a mathematician, but some people consider him a mathematician. Um, he was a military spy, he was a military architect. Uh, he was a pathologist, um, probably shouldn't have been. Um, <laughs> he was a, he was a, a writer, a musician. Um, he used to plan weddings, he was a wedding planner. Um, he, he was an amazing guy, and, and he didn't care about the barriers of academics or the barriers of any particular discipline. That might be because he never went to college. Um, he was actually um, the son of a slave, uh, probably a 15-year-old slave from, um, from the Middle East. And, uh, and for that reason, he wasn't allowed to go to, to universities in Italy at the time. Um, he was quite the character. He, uh, he was known to be a colorful dresser. He was probably a real pain to work for. Um, I like to say that he was a, a master of yogiisms. Um, he had all kinds of interesting sayings if you read his notes. This is one of my favorites. Um, it says, men of genius sometimes accomplish the most when they work the least, uh, which is kind of nice if, you, if you're a couch potato. Um, but anyway, um, I won't go into his life, but it's, it's a fascinating life. Um, and, uh, but the one thing that's clear is, is Leonardo da Vinci was what I would call a hyper transdisciplinary dude. This guy did everything. His life was definitely not long enough, no question about it. Um, and that's where the term Renaissance man comes from. Um, and uh, that's an unfortunate term, Renaissance man. Um, it implies, first of all, that you gotta be a man, right? We don't talk about Renaissance women very often or Renaissance person, uh, it's Renaissance man. Um, another thing about this image is experts now believe 
that this image was probably uh, sketched um, using, no doubt this is his work, uh, but somewhere in the 1490s. Um, and if you look at the top, I think I've got the date up there. Uh, he was born in 1452. Um, the other thing about da Vinci is it was reported that he was quite handsome. Um, and so if you look at this image, he would have been about 40 some years old and uh, I've kind of blocked out his face a little bit, but I don't know about you, but I wouldn't consider this to be the face of a handsome 40 year old. Um, so it's very unlikely that this is an image of da Vinci. Um, but this is our view of a Renaissance man. This is our view of a genius, okay? So we have these biases about what a genius looks like. When we look at one another, we have biases about, this guy is smart, right? He looks smart. Or, you know, so, so anyway, the, the point is that um, this is a great example of how, you know, we are inherently biased in, in the way we view one another and in the way we view the world. Um, and by the way, this is what the picture looks like now. Um, and it's, it's been fading uh, rather dramatically over the years. Um, we have a paper conservator here now, by the way. Is she here uh, in the back? So yeah, so she probably can tell us why this is fading. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a tragedy. Um, so bias. So many of you have probably seen this little example. If you haven't, um, you'll enjoy it. Um, so this is a, a picture of two tables. Um, and uh, this actually is in the front of that book that I'm passing around, Blind Spot. So if you don't believe this, this little illustration, if you get a copy of Blind Spot, you can prove it to yourself. Um, but um, you can see that the, the tables are different. This one's rather narrow and long, and this one is a little bit wider and a little bit shorter, right? Does everybody agree with that? Yeah? Okay. But if I, if I rotate this table and I superimpose it on the other one, what you discover is those surfaces are exactly the same. The dimensions are exactly the same. And so our mind um, plays tricks on us. In this case, you know, we, we see this table as a three-dimensional object rather than a two-dimensional object. No matter how long you look at this table over here, you're not going to convince yourself that that dimension is the same as that dimension, and that dimension is the same as that dimension. And even if I turn it sideways, you still wouldn't convince yourself probably that they're the same when you look at them. And the screen may have distorted things a little bit. Usually I do this on an overhead projector, um, but I think you get the idea. So we have these biases. So um, this, this course that I teach on, on the, the science of art is, um, ha has a number of underlying themes. One of them I said is transdisciplinarity. The other one is, is, is trying to overcome your bias and understand your biases. So um, one of the themes that I use in my class, and I do this in all my classes actually, I, 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 I teach diversity in solid state thermodynamics, phase transformations in kinetics, and other incredibly boring courses. Um, but um, the, the theme that I, that I always use and I always repeat is, is this, and I paraphrase this um, from uh, Atkins PCHEM text, if any of you have ever used it. And it says that proof of, and you can fill in the blank, proof of a mechanism, proof of provenance, proof of provenience, proof of a scientific hypothesis, um, uh, is, is less like a mathematical proof than it is like a proof in a court of law. And what that means is that you need to use many different techniques um, in order to understand something. And also, if you can use many different opinions, it helps to understand something. So this, this sentence helps, or this phrase, helps to understand you know, the importance of diversity as I'm teaching my courses. And uh, th this is you know, why it's important and why cultural agility and aware of our biases is important. Um, if, if you understand your biases and you have cultural agility, um, it helps you to um, obtain what I'll call higher order skills. Sometimes we call these soft skills. Um, I heard someone recently say soft skills is a terrible word. We need to call it something else. And so higher order skills is, is a better term for that. Um, it helps us make better decisions, interpret things more accurately. Um, we achieve greater emotional intelligence and, uh, and leadership skills. It enables us to navigate in a global economy. Um, as a university, um, having cultural agility and awareness of bias can help us attract more diverse faculty and student body, um, and it makes life more interesting. Okay? So those are the reasons it's important. Um, and so this is the way that I do it in the class. Um, so this is a, just an example of one of the classes that I taught. 
and I call this the, the transdisciplinary course concept. What you do is you, is you have some sort of a, a vertically integrated project or vertically integrated um, program where um, you bring in students from a variety of different disciplines. And the last semester I taught this, this was the composition of the class. I had students from psychology, um, from visual arts, sociology, chemistry, material science, public policy, philosophy, art conservation, art history, and social work, which is a really bizarre mix of people, you might think, right? Um, and the whole idea of this is, um, is that you set up a game that is, is super fun. So when I used to coach soccer, I coached for like 24 years. And the one thing that I learned is that, you know, in order to teach skills and in order to get players in, in, in good shape, um, you don't make them run laps. You don't ex over explain the skill and tell them exactly what you want them to do. What you do is create some sort of a game that is just so much fun that they learn the skills and they get in shape. And by the end of the practice, they don't want to stop playing. They want to keep going. If you have them run sprints and you, or you try to explain a skill to them, they get bored and they lose enthusiasm. So the whole idea is to create this game that is, that is really, really fun. Um, and um, it was a little bit more complicated than that. So this is the composition of the students. Um, I also, um, so you kind of break down the barriers of the departments of the students, but I also broke down the barriers on campus. And um, my research group was part of the class. And so the students had access to my laboratory. They could go in and out and work. Um, they were very connected with the Walters Museum so they could hold telecons with the museum. And then I had a variety of other faculty and staff um, coming and going. Um, the library was very, very involved. Um, we had a, a faculty member from art history who um, helped me a great deal. Um, faculty from art. I had an English professor. And it was very odd. I had this professor uh, from, Engl or from, uh, uh, from the English department who actually lived in Mexico and studied cochineal, which is a dye. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. In fact, I've got some samples of cochineal here. So cochineal is an insect, um, and um, it, is, uh, it is also a source of red dye. So um, if you uh, take, you're welcome to take some samples of this. If you do, um, be careful. Uh, when you have an opportunity, you can take it and crush it up, put a little water in your hand, and it'll dye your hand. But if you get it on your clothes, it'll wreck your clothes. So, um, and it has been used as an ingredient, for example, in lipstick. Um, so if you wear red lipstick and you're vegan, you have bugs on your lips, just a warning. Um, and uh, it, it also, for example, was used uh, in the color of the red coats, uh, you know, the British uh, during the, the Revolutionary War wore cochineal. Um, pirates used to invade ships, taking cochineal over to Europe um, back in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, so anyway, um, this, this professor from English actually was a scholar of cochineal, which was kind of crazy. So he was part of the class. Uh, and then I had a student actually from Mexico um, who had just visited, in fact, this week, uh, who was an expert in conservation science, and she helped me with the class. So the whole idea is you, you flip the class, you empower the students, and, uh, and, and you get them involved with all of these folks. The other thing I did, which is a bit controversial, I'm sure, is that I had a, what I call a dynamic syllabus. It's a nice way to say that my syllabus changed every week. Um, and usually you get criticized for that. But the idea, you know, in research, things don't always go the way that you, you think it will. So the idea was, you know, you have this syllabus that you establish in the beginning, and then every week you sit down with the students and you ask yourself, are we going in the right direction? Should we modify it? So by the end of the semester, I might have like five or six versions of the syllabus, but the students all had input in how to change the syllabus as we went along. Um, so they were kind of empowered to um, be part of the curriculum. So the, the technique that I used was uh, to um, establish a project that involved reverse engineering. And, and I use the term reverse engineering because I'm an engineer. Um, so when I say reverse engineering art, um, my definition of that is it is the process of discovery um, through the analysis of structure, function, purpose, operation, provenance, and provenience. And if you don't know, provenance describes sort of how an object has been handed off through time. Provenience is a term that describes where it came from originally. So provenience is the beginning of provenance. Okay, so we're, in this class, we're trying to determine maybe where it came from, how it was handed off over time, what it was for, um, how did it operate if there was an operation, uh, and, and what is its structure. 
and structure means different things to different people. If I ask uh, an artist what structure means, they'll give me a different answer than if I asked a, a material scientist. So we all have our own definitions of these things as well. Um, so reverse engineering is maybe not the greatest term. As I said, I use it because I'm an engineer. If you're in another field, you might call it you know, archaeology. You could call it um, uh, dissection. Um, chemical analysis, there's all kinds of other terms. So depending on your field, you, would, you might use some other term. Um, so here's an example of a, of a piece of art. And uh, any guesses, you know, when this was painted? Um, what year, perhaps? No guesses? Does it look like it, any, any experts in st art style? Turner? Turner? That's, that's a pretty close. That's close. Yeah. So this, this looks like it might have been painted in the, maybe the 1800s or so. It looks like a, 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 maybe a 19th century American Hudson River. You guys agree with that? No? Yeah, good. I'm glad because actually it's not even close. Um, so, so I painted this picture actually. And, and this, this, painting, this painting I know a lot about, um, as it turns out, um, because um, I made the canvas um, using Belgian linen and I glued it to a piece of birch wood. And then I made all the pigments and um, I, I, I mixed them with a binder and a siccative to make the paint. And, and then I painted it and I know exactly how many layers. It was painted in 12 layers and I used a glazing technique. So this is painted in, in different layers of glaze to give it sort of a luminous appearance. Um, and, uh, and so I know a lot about this painting, okay? So if I were to hand this painting to you and ask you to analyze it without telling you all that, and ask you to figure out what it was, what, you know, all those things I just talked about. Where did it come from? Why was it painted? What is, it per, what is its purpose, et cetera? You would all approach this problem probably in a different way, right? And if, I, if you're a chemist or a material scientist, the first thing you might want to do is cut it apart and start looking at the cross sections, right? Which would be okay. You wouldn't go to jail for that, right? Um, on the other hand, if it was this painting, right, uh, it'd be a different story. So if I asked you to reverse engineer this, um, a, 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 your techniques would be much, much different, right? Um, you would have to use non-destructive techniques. You'd have to be very, very careful. There's all kinds of procedures that would go into the process of trying to understand this particular and very famous painting, which is obviously by, by da Vinci. Um, here's another one um, that is probably even more important and more value, valuable. Has anybody ever um, visited the fr caves in France? Nobody? Um, you, one person? Um, these are amazing, amazing caves. Um, so these paintings, and this is a huge collection of paintings in these caves in France, uh, were painted 30, 000, in 30,000 BC, over 30,000 years ago. Unbelievable pieces of art. And um, it's thought that they were painted um, by the, the same individual for the most part. And this cave actually collapsed, um, or this cave that the, the um, that these paintings are in had a collapse in the front of it and was sealed off for many, many years. So these paintings were all really, really well preserved. In fact, they were so well preserved that some of the people that were kind of studying these, these paintings um, could find pieces of ash stuck to the wall. You know, if you take a stick and you scrape it on a wall, little pieces of white ash will stick there. The pieces of white ash were still stuck on the wall from 30,000 BC. So this cave was incredibly well preserved. And whoever this artist was, was you know, able to see in 3D and quite remarkable. Um, so um, how, you, how you analyze something depends on what the object is. Um, so here's uh, just kind of a list of why we care about analyzing art and items of cultural heritage. Um, we want to understand if they're authentic. We want to understand what the materials were. Uh, if they're degrading, what is the degradation mechanism? Um, what are the, the methods of previous restoration? Sometimes these objects have been restored, um, sometimes not so well, as it turns out, and you've got to be very careful handing them. Uh, again, pro provenience and provenance. Um, and then, uh, let's see, um, what is the, uh, the cultural purpose, the choice and methods of conservation? Um, there might be some ethical considerations for how you handle them, non-destructive, minimally destructive. Um, you may need to repatriate the object. In other words, you might be trying to understand this object so you can give it back to the original owner. Um, the, uh, another thing that's very important is understanding the cultural values and the proper respect and handling for objects. 
Um, Native American objects are a really great example. Um, when you're handling a Native American object, you've got to be extremely careful. Um, and there's all kinds of social implications as well as political implications as well as getting in the newspaper if you do something wrong with one of these objects. Um, if you go to the Smithsonian, they have uh, Native American objects which are in different parts of the museum. In some cases, only males are allowed to go in one area and only females are allowed to go in the other area um, because some objects are, are, are not to be seen by males and not to be seen by females. And so you have to respect those traditions. And so there's a lot to um, this, this, uh, you know, this field, understanding art and cultural heritage. It's much more than just looking at something under a microscope. It involves all kinds of different disciplines and, and viewpoints. Um, so here's uh, an example of um, you know, how people have dealt with, um, uh, with preservation and, and, and conservation. So this is an image from the caves in France. And the caves in France, it turns out, because we opened up these caves and let humans in, um, we started to destroy them. So they were there for over 30,000 years. They, they, they were uh, occupied by humans for a few years. And the process of, of exposing them to humans in the atmosphere started to lead to their degradation. Molds started to form on the walls, et cetera. Um, and so what the, 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 the experts in, in France did, and the government in France did, was to um, shut the caves off completely. Um, but before they did that, they went in and imaged the entire cave. Um, I think they used LIDAR, um, took photographs of all the objects, um, and then seal it off. And then they reproduced the cave completely. So they've made a whole new series of caves, which are gigantic. They're hundreds of meters in length. And they had artists come in and reproduce all the images. So this is a, a great example of how science told the experts to seal off the cave, preserve it, um, which we do to many pieces of art now, um, and then make a, a reproduction. Uh, so making reproductions is a really a, a whole other area of science that, that um, is just starting to evolve. Um, you can actually buy a, a, an almost perfect Van Gogh painting now. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, Fujifilm has uh, collaborated with the Van Gogh Museum um, in Amsterdam, and they've developed a technology for making an almost perfect Van Gogh. Uh, so they make a mold, they actually put an object on, on the painting, make a mold, and then they do a 3D print of, of the painting. Um, it has the texture of a Van Gogh. Um, it the brush strokes are all there. Um, you can see the cracks. I've been told that in some cases the fingerprint might be there. And they not only print the front of the painting, but they print the frame and they print the back of the painting. And so all the stickers that go along with the provenience are printed on the back. And if you didn't know better, you'd think it was a perfect Van Gogh. Um, and you can buy one of these right now for about $30,000. Um, the price will start to come down, but the beauty of that is that we can preserve art through technology now. Um, and we can, we, you know, we can still appreciate what the artist did, but we can take the original artwork and we can put it into storage and, and preserve it, uh, just like these caves are being preserved now. Um, restoration is a very scary thing. Um, and uh, that's another, I was just, when I was in Mexico this, earlier this week, um, one of my students is a master restorer, and uh, she's restoring all kinds of interesting pieces of art in, in uh, Catholic churches down there. It's quite interesting. Um, but um, restoration is ex an extremely high risk area, and if you, in order to become a restorer, it takes a tremendous amount of training. Um, this I put in there more for the fun of it, but this is a, an example of restoration gone wrong. Um, uh, and then another thing is understanding you know, why things are degrading. For example, the, the two objects that I just showed you. Um, and there's a phenomenon going on right now in the world where the yellows from uh, the late 1800s of many artists are starting to degrade. Um, and yellow is a really important color to some artists. Van Gogh in particular used yellow a lot to uh, create a mood of anxiety, um, his, both his yellows and greens. And so when you look at some of his paintings, it kind of has a tendency to make you anxious. And, uh, uh, but it's, and, and it was very important also in Monk's paintings and others. Um, these artists, these three artists in particular, Matisse, Monk, and Van Gogh, um, their, their artwork is all um, experiencing some degradation. Not all of it, but a fraction of it. Um, for example, Monk has four versions of the scream. Um, and two of them are degrading, but two of them are not. 
Um, and uh, a number of Van Gogh's paintings, especially his flowers and some of the paintings of the fields um, are degrading where he used yellow. So what's happening is the yellow is turning sort of gray or a white color. And uh, this happened rather suddenly. And it happened to all these paintings rather suddenly. It didn't happen gradually. It kind of was a very sudden thing. So um, one of my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Jennifer Mass, um, at the Winterthur Museum, she's now in New York actually, um, has these incredible credentials that allows her to analyze paintings like this. Um, and um, she uses synchrotron radiation often to look at this kind of object. And this is some work she did. I can't remember which painting this was. I think this was um, off of a monk painting. Um, but one of the things she was able to prove using um, uh, a technique called exanes, which is basically an x-ray method at a synchrotron, that she was able to prove that the, the uh, yellow paints actually contain a substantial amount of chlorine. And most of the yellows are made um, with cadmium uh, pigments, cadmium-based pigments. Some are made with chrome-based pigments, but most of the, this, this artwork is made with, with cadmium-based pigments. And she discovered a significant amount of cadmium chloride in the pigments, um, which indicated that these were poor quality pigments. Um, Monk, Matisse, uh, and, and uh, Van Gogh were all relatively poor artists, as you may know. Um, they didn't have a lot of money, and so oftentimes uh, they would buy substandard materials. In the case of Monk, he painted on cardboard and you know, uh, you know, would reuse his, his, his uh, uh, materials, and, and so they all used materials at times that were substandard. But anyway, she was able to prove that, that this cadmium chloride, which is a precursor to making these these other cadmium compounds that are the pigments was left behind. And somehow this material had diffused to the surface and oxidized and destroyed the, the, the original color. Um, here's another application of synchrotron radiation. Um, this is some work on another one of Van Gogh's paintings. And this is a, a kind of a zoomed up area of one of his paintings of a field, which he would have painted in southern France uh, later in his life. Um, and what they discovered, surprisingly, they were trying to understand why this painting was degrading. What they discovered, surprisingly, was that underneath there was a face. Um, and uh, they were able to see the face visually, um, and then they were able to determine the chemical composition of the pigments in the face using synchrotrons, looking under the layer. This is non-destructive. And then using a computer technique, they then reproduced you know, what the image looked like and if you know um, about the history of Van Gogh, early in his life, he painted peasants um, in his hometown um, or nearby who were potato pickers. And so this is one of the original images of a face of one of the potato pickers, or he sometimes he called them the potato eaters, um, which was the basis for his first masterpiece, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, here's another example, similar example in a different field of art. Um, this is um, a, uh, an image of uh, a, a, a piece of, from an opera um, that was um, written in the late 1700s. So Ciabini, who was a, a, a great writer of operas, uh, wrote this, this opera and then performed it. And um, just like today, the, the media, you know, they had critics in the media, and so this opera was criticized. At the time, it was said to be really long and really boring, and so he got ticked off, and he just blocked out the entire thing, and uh, that opera was lost for all time, or at least we thought. And uh, so what ended up happening was the, uh, some folks at Stanford University uh, uh, got um, the original copy of this, and using synchrotron radiation, they were able to actually image um, the notes underneath and they pulled out, it's a little hard to see perhaps, but they pulled out the original music and then they replayed the opera at Stanford University. Um, I don't know if Ciabini would have appreciated that, but um, anyway, it shows the, sort of the possibility of, of bringing um, text back to life, which is a challenge sometimes. Um, okay, you recognize this painting, I assume, right? This is, what's this called, anybody know? Starry Night, right? Um, and, uh, it's, a, it's quite an impressive painting, as you'll agree. Um, again, though, this is not Van Gogh. I painted this. But um, this, this painting, actually, if you want to see it, it's hanging in Jesse Pugh's office over in the, uh, Sutton, or the Browning Building. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out is that researching art is actually very accessible in some ways. 
And also being able to appreciate art is getting very accessible. Um, if I want to go to the Van Gogh Museum, you know, I have to buy a plane ticket, go over there and, and spend a lot of money, and then probably wait in line behind a big crowd. Um, but um, it is now possible to look at paintings in high resolution um, and appreciate um, the degradation, appreciate um, the brush strokes, and appreciate the art. Um, and what's really cool is if you have a, have a huge screen, is to put this on a giant screen or a giant wall, because you, you can really appreciate the art then. But I'm gonna go into this, this is Google Art. If you haven't done this before, uh, you should go home and do this immediately, because it's pretty amazing. Um, so I'm gonna just go ahead and see if I can find Starry Night here. I'm gonna go into Artists, and there's Van Gogh. And um, I'm sure Starry Night will be right there. There it is. So here's Starry Night. And um, so when you go into this, the lighting might not be great in here to really appreciate this, but you can zoom in. And because it is high resolution, sometimes there's a little delay. Let's see. Zoom in. So I'm going in on these brush strokes, and I'm not all the way there yet. So you can get, so this is pretty incredible. Um, you can actually see the canvas underneath, and I'm not all the way in yet. You can see the brush strokes, and um, here's a little bit of cracking. If you, if you go to the center of the paintings, oftentimes the center will have more cracking, or the upper corners, you'll find more degradation at those regions because the canvas expands more, as you can imagine. Um, but you can go in and, and find cracks. You can study crack patterns. Um, so you can understand the handling of the painting. Um, occasionally, you can actually see evidence of restoration. A lot of artwork, um, especially like during World War II, was stuck in a basement or in a cave or someplace against a wall. And what you'll find is at the bottom or one of the other edges, whichever edge was touching the ground, would have uh, been in contact with moisture, and that's where degradation would happen. And restorers today, don't, they don't try to restore it so that it looks like the exact image. What they do is they try to restore it so that it leaves a fingerprint so you know that it was restored. So for example, if I'm gonna restore um, an area that's purple, I won't just go in and try to match it and paint it purple. What I'll do is I'll get some blue and I'll get some red and I'll draw some perfect vertical lines, and little tiny ones. And so from a distance, it'll look purple, but when I get up close, I'll be able to see the signature. And so if you look at enough paintings, you might be able to find evidence of restoration in some of them. Uh, so you can do science online now. Um, which makes it very accessible to people all over the world, people with handicaps, et cetera. Pretty amazing. Um, anyway, that's enough time on that, but um, if you ha have never looked at it, um, take a look. And I, 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 I don't know where they're at with statues, but I suspect it's not, they're not too far away from having 3D visualization of objects, too. Um, and they may already be doing it. I haven't, I haven't looked recently. Um, so let's see. It looks like my... There we go. Um, so this leads to one of my projects. And, um, and so this is um, the mummy project, I like to call it. Um, and um, around 200 BC um, into, you know, towards 200, 300 AD, uh, the Ptolemaic Empire um, uh, was established. Rome invaded all kinds of areas around um, the uh, Mediterranean. And at that time, um, there was this uh, difference, this clash of cultures. And in Egypt, um, the artwork was, was rather um, sort of cartoonish, superficial, so to speak, where at the same time, um, the Romans um, painted um, and, and had very, very realistic pieces of art. The statues were very realistic. The paintings were very realistic. And so these two cultures came together. And, uh, and, and what happened is the um, Egyptians, uh, what I'm calling Egyptians now, um, uh, started to adopt the Greek and Roman methods of artwork. And so this is a, an image of a portrait um, from Egypt, and you can see the, the contrast between the two. And it's not entirely clear why this started to happen. Um, there are some theories on it. Um, one of the theories is that um, by having one of these portraits, if you put it onto your sarcophagus um, after you, you passed away, um, that the death tax would be waived. So when you died, there was a tax um, in order to be um, mummified and, and put into um, the catacombs, et cetera. And so they thought 
so there's a theory that perhaps that's the reason these uh, portraits existed. Um, many of the portraits, or the majority of the portraits, come from a region um, called Thayum, which is south of, of what's Alexandria and, and Cairo now. And so this little box shows the region where of Thayum. And uh, so oftentimes these portraits are called Thayum portraits. Um, they were discovered in a couple other areas too. This is a particularly spectacular example of one of these, these portraits. And um, you can see the Egyptian sarcophagus and then this image that was like glued onto the, onto the head of it um, kind of creates this fusion of what I'll call Egyptian religious rites, Roman artistic style, and Greek cultural traditions. Um, and uh, kind of a bizarre thing, um, but there are about a thousand of these portraits that have been discovered in the, in the world. Um, here's a, a really nice example. Some of these are quite um, spectacular pieces of art. Um, they range in quality from something that looks like Da Vinci painted it to something that looks like a Fred Flintstone cartoon <laughs> and, and the whole spectrum. And, and so they were painted by many different artists, clearly, uh, from different regions representing different family members. So there's a, pro there's a program that was created um, with association with the Getty Museum, um, the British Museum of History, the Walters Museum, and a few other museums. And it's called um, the APPEAR program, which stands for Ancient Panel Paintings, Examination, Analysis, and Research. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to get invited to be part of that. And, and do some analyses for them. And these are, this is an example of, of one analysis. Um, uh, this is a, a first cut at analyzing these materials. Remember, they're, they're, these are super precious. They're one of a kind. Um, and this is an example of, of one of the mummy portraits. And this is the one that I analyzed. Um, and we call it Man with the Beard, uh, very original. And um, again, non it has to be non-destructive. And uh, so we did this non-destructive analysis on this. And it's difficult to see here, but there's a little purple region right here, which we call a clavi. And this clavi would have represented um, sort of the nobility of the person, maybe the equestrian status, something like that. But it was purple, which is fairly rare. Um, you may, might recall that purple is a color that was reserved for royalty. Um, there were, it's thought that there were times where you could have been put to death for wearing purple. Um, and um, uh, at, it, during that period, um, most of the purple would have come from a little carnivorous snail called a murex. Um, and if you take one of these little snails and you squeeze it, a purple dye will come out of, you can guess where. Um, and then that dye could be used to make, um, to color clothing. And so Cleopatra loved to wear purple. Uh, and she used to actually throw big parties where the whole room was purple. So you can imagine how many of these poor little snails gave their life um, to this, this uh, you know, very important color. So that's why it was so important. Purple is also, um, it's the color of, of birth, it's the color of death. Um, if you look at the, the, the spectrum of light, um, it's the end of the spectrum of light. So it represents the end of the known and the beginning of the unknown. Um, and it's a very bizarre color when you think about it because if you look at the spectrum of light, purple's at the violet is at the very end, but red and blue are down here. Purple's not between red and blue, it's at the end of the spectrum. If you look at the other um, uh, colors, like green, for example, is a mix of red and blue, or excuse me, blue and yellow, green is between those. So it's a really interesting color when you start to study the science of purple. Why is purple at the end of the spectrum and not between red and blue? Um, but anyway, when we analyzed this, we discovered um, chrome. And this was a really unusual discovery. It's hard to uh, uh, maybe give you an appreciation for it, but the discovery of chrome was a, was a big um, deal when we found this. And uh, it also um, gave us some optimism that we might be able to use this particular element to correlate these paintings with one another. Because um, if you can find pur purple in other paintings and also find chrome in other paintings, there might be some way to correlate them to one another. Um, so um, we couldn't do much more with the painting unless we started to like dive into it. And uh, I, uh, uh, when I say dive into it, I mean dissect it a little bit. And um, I was given a particle um, of, of one of the uh, pigments from this purple region in the painting, um, which was kind of a big deal. And here's a picture of the particle. Actually, you gotta get permission from the board of directors at the museum to do this. Um, and this is a 50 micron bar down here. Um, I'll show you a picture of this later on, on superimposed on human hair. 
Um, so uh, human hair is about 50 microns in diameter. So this particle is about the, the size of the diameter of a human hair. Um, and uh, so uh, we then uh, analyzed this particle and I went in and I used a technique called EDS, very, very commonly used technique, um, to take a first look at it and looked at a bunch of different spots on this particle. And uh, this is where it gets less exciting. Um, so this is some chemical analysis data. And we did discover some chrome. We also discovered some iron um, in these materials. Um, and the chrome, again, um, might give us hints at connections. I, uh, this slide is actually out of place. But um, one of the things we discovered in another painting was chrome. And we are now trying to prove or disprove whether or not these two paintings were done by the same artist, because both of them show about the same amount of chrome, as well as other characteristics. They look like they're painted by the same artist. They also look maybe like their brother and sister, too. Who knows? So if, if, if this works out, it would be the first time any of these portraits have been correlated with one another. Um, the other thing we see a lot of is oxygen and carbon in this particular pigment. Um, and then we also see aluminum, potassium, and, and, uh, and silicon all correlated with one another. Um, so to kind of make a long story short and put all of this together, these elements suggest that um, this pigment may have been what's called a lake pigment. The term lake comes from lacquer. Um, lacquer um, used to have a, often has kind of a reddish color, and that's where the term comes from. It doesn't mean lake, like, uh, like in a lake, um, it means lacquer. And, uh, and, and so our, our, our speculation um, was, and I'm jumping way ahead in some sense, was that this pigment was a synthetic pigment, um, that the Egyptians actually figured out how to make a synthetic purple pigment. Um, we, we think that they probably used a plant or an insect, and um, the cochineal that's going around is, is an insect. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but it may have been um, easier to, do, to make this pigment from uh, a plant, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. The aluminum, the silicon, and the potassium are signatures for what's called a mordant. Um, and so when you make a dye, for example, if you make a red dye um, out of matter root, um, that dye will adhere to clothing fairly easily. But it's, it's, you can't make a powder out of it and incorporate it, for example, into a binder in order to make a paint. What you have to do is attach it to something. And what you often do is attach it to either silica or a clay. Uh, that's a, called a mordant. And a very common mordant, uh, which I'll show you in a little bit, is based on aluminum, silicon, and potassium. I'll come back to that. Um, and this is showing uh, a plot of the, cor the how, uh, showing how aluminum and potassium are correlated. So they're... So whenever we analyze a region in our specimen that has aluminum, and uh, there's always potassium associated with it, and the, the, the two are strongly correlated, suggesting that these come from the same thing. In other words, they come from the same mineral. Um, and uh, this is a, a picture that I took in Guatemala um, of a, a woman who did a little demo for us um, of uh, her process for making, in this case, red dye. And so she was making red dye from cochineal. So if you take those bugs that I just passed around and you crush them up, put them in water, um, and she heats it up uh, to make it more, um, uh, uh, more able to adhere to the fabric, um, able to fix to the fabric. Um, but anyway, she, this, in the background, it's a little hard to see, but there's a whole array of different um, sources of raw materials in order to make these pigments. The Egyptians would have had access to similar types of materials. So it's very likely that they were, they were making various dyes, it's known that they were making various dyes using raw materials like these. And here's a picture of her hand holding a cochineal bug that she just crushed up. It was dead when she did that. Uh, and here's um, uh, some of the organic pigments that we worked on in, in my class. So um, we use matter re root, we use cochineal. Cochineal would not have been available to the Egyptians, at least we don't think so, only if there was shipping available from South and Central America. Um, Kermes is an insect that could have been available to the Egyptians, uh, so we looked at Kermes. Uh, we also looked at lichens. Another possibility that was that in indigo was involved in, in this, um, but indigo has a lot of nitrogen in it, and we didn't observe any nitrogen 
in our, in our pigment. So we eliminated that as a possibility, although we did do some research on it. But most of our research was focused on these materials. And uh, so um, this is a, a now diving into the pigment. So I told you this pigment is about 50 microns across. Um, we do have technology now that allows us to go in and machine uh, something that's 50 microns across. So you can machine a human hair now. Um, and uh, this is just showing one of my students uh, who, and showing um, some of the work she did on this pigment. So we went in and cut out these little pieces. Not only do you have to get permission to um, analyze the pigment that's 50 microns and almost invisible, you have to get permission to machine the pigment too, um, which is kind of amazing. So that's how precious these materials are. Um, here's a picture of the pigment um, superimposed on a human hair at the same magnification. And this is um, one of the samples that I machined out of. This is called an atom probe sample. And uh, I actually had to increase the magnification by 10 times in order for you to be able to see it. So this is, this is the a magnification of one of the samples at 10x. But you get some appreciation for the kind of work we're doing. This is not by definition non-destructive analysis, but it's as close as you can get. Um, just to emphasize that point, um, when this particle was shipped to us, um, we actually couldn't find it. Um, and that was, so it was shipped between two glass slides, but we couldn't find it. It took two days to find it. Um, and uh, so we were a little bit scared. Um, so they're very, very small, okay? All right, so here's, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of analyses, but um, this is one of my research faculty, Yao Chao Wu, who's uh, analyzing this material. And essentially with those little samples, we can stick them in microscopes or stick them in an atom probe and we can analyze their chemistry, we can analyze their crystal structure, and we can get all kinds of information. Um, so just to show you some of the info we got, this is kind of an amazing sample. I think we got really, really lucky. Um, but this is a, a TEM cross-section of um, one, of the, um, uh, one of the areas of the pigment. And um, if you look really, really closely, there are three zones in here. Down here, you'll notice that there's sort of I don't know, I'm gonna, I use the term microstructure. There's fine grains, there's a fine microstructure. In the middle, the microstructure gets a little bit coarser. In other words, there's larger particles. And as you go outward, there's even larger particles. Um, what we discovered is that the composition also changed. As you go this direction, you have more lead. As you go this direction, you have more sulfur. Um, and uh, um, and, and the, this particle size suggests that what you might be observing is some sort of a nucleation and growth process, where down here you're starting to nucleate particles, and as you go outward, the particles are getting larger and larger and growing, okay? And uh, so all those pieces of evidence put together um, makes us believe, or gives us the idea anyway, uh, or, the, or, or allows us to speculate um, that these um, dyes um, that the Egyptians used were turned into to pigments uh, using the process that I just described a minute ago, and I'll show you the chemistry of that. And this is a, um, a, uh, an example of um, a, uh, a sketch from Flinders Petrie of the British, uh, what was he, the British School of Archaeology, who excavated um, a dyer's workshop in Egypt. And when he excavated this, um, what he discovered is that there were many vats made out of lead. Um, and so the dyes that were prepared in Egypt were at least at times prepared in lead vats. So the lead that you see in, um, in these samples, we believe came from the vat. It wasn't added intentionally. So the theory that we came up with is that um, the Egyptians made red dye in vats. Um, the lead was a contaminant. It wasn't added intentionally. We're not sure if they added chrome and iron, but we think they may have added it intentionally because we believe that what would happen is if you add chrome and iron two dyes based on matter, you would shift the color towards purple. That wasn't proven at the time, so we wanted to prove that. Um, and, uh, and then following that, they would be able to harvest this dye and, and convert it into a, uh, a pigment um, using this process. So um, these pigments, which are made from these natural materials, which you call anthroquinones, um, start off as a dye. Matter root is a great example, which is a red dye. And then you add um, this dye to these uh, different salts, alum salt, potash, and, uh, and then you produ produce this 
uh, amorphous uh, hydrate, which we call a morden. And this is the substrate, so to speak. This is the, the surface that the dye attaches itself to. Um, and uh, so my students set out to try to prove this, and this is just a little example of some of their work. Some of it was really interesting. Um, so they, they took the matter root and, um, and then, in some cases, added lead to it to see if the lead affected the color, but they also added various salts in order to shift the color towards purple. And they were able to produce some very vivid purples. Probably the, the, the best um, uh, purple that was produced, though, was produced in one of my students' apartments um, because I wouldn't let him do it in the lab. And uh, this was a very creative student. And he read Pliny the Elder. And have you guys read Pliny the Elder before? Pliny um, explored the Mediterranean Sea um, uh, back around 0 AD. And um, he actually died during the eruption of Vesuvius um, just offshore of a heart attack. Um, but he wrote all these volumes. And one of my students went and read Pliny the Elder and discovered this recipe for making purple, which was based on lichen and urine. And so he fermented lichen in his own urine at home uh, for six months. And then one day he brought in this vivid purple that was unbelievable. Um, his name was Elagio Lorino, and uh, he um, ended up uh, getting a job um, at several museums. And, and I'll show you some of his work a little bit later. But an incredibly creative student who's an art student that actually made purple dye using ancient Egyptian techniques in his apartment with his own urine. Um, so really interesting guy. So anyway, um, just to make a long story short, because I, I have limited time, but um, what the students did was basically to, to understand this pigment using scientific techniques. They also wanted to understand the meaning. I didn't go into the meaning of the, the purple and all that very, very much, but they, they synthesized the dyes. They synthesized purples. Um, they then um, developed a process for attaching it to a mordant, and then they made what are called encaustic paints. And the Egyptians use encaustics. Encaustics are, are waxes, and the Egyptians use beeswax. So uh, my students use beeswax in order to make paint. And then um, one of my students, who was very creative, Elagio, uh, started to paint um, a portrait using ancient Egyptian techniques. And then in the end, this was the product of the whole class. So they reverse engineered. Um, the pigment and the dyes. Um, they used ancient Egyptian techniques. Um, and then ultimately, one of my students painted a portrait, and he was working on this for a whole year. And he, he said that he had a model on campus he was using that he found that looked a lot like the bearded man. Um, but it turned out this is actually a self-portrait of Elagio, which was pretty cool. Um, he didn't put the purple clavi in yet because he wants to make sure that we actually have it right and we know exactly how they made it. Uh, so the purple clavite will be added sometime in the future. Um, so I'm going to kind of stop there. I'm just going to kind of summarize. Um, again, this, this sort of transdisciplinary concept is a different way of teaching. I think we do this on campus, for example. It's fair to say that the, the Lausanne Center does this, right? This is the kind of thing that they do. Um, the whole idea is you create these vertically integrated projects that the students really love. Um, you um, bring in diverse students. Um, and then you, you um, provide all kinds of resources, and I, I like to call these quiet um, resources. And, and uh, this is just a little illustration of uh, science and art. One on the left is Da Vinci, and then I'll, I'll stop here. Um, and, if you're, and, and so I'll just say, speaking of art, um, uh, if you haven't been to our building, um, the Sutton Building um, on campus, it's a piece of earth art. Um, it's a beautiful building, and you can actually take a little virtual tour of the building. I put the little um, HTTP uh, down on the bottom there, but um, come and visit and, uh, and learn a little bit more about our college as well. So thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity if you'd like to ask a question of Daryl. Um, I'm going to pass around the microphone. It's not going to magnify your voice, but it's recording for posterity so that the students that are not born yet will be able to help understand <laughs> what we've uh, been able to understand and share today. So do you have any questions? You said that the color yellow degraded all of a sudden instead of yeah. slowly. So why did it degrade all of a sudden, and when did it happen? Yeah, I mean, it started about 20 years ago, from what I understand. And uh, I think the answer to that isn't really understood. 
Um, but the paintings were all painted around the same time period with the same pigments. And so it's just thought that, you know, something, something in, 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 the, in the paint just it took that long for it to happen. Gotcha. And uh, they probably all use similar substandard paints, yeah. The second question is, uh, I didn't get a look at that first book about color, so could you repeat the title? Yeah, Victoria Finley is the author, and the, the book is called Color. And it actually, so what Victoria Finley did was she traveled around the world uh, to places where various pigments and dyes came from. And so, for example, uh, she went to um, the, the region around Beirut uh, to learn about the color purple um, and spent time there. And, uh, and learned about the culture and then wrote a chapter on it. She went to Australia to study ochres, and, uh, which is where, you know, if you look at um, Aborigine artwork um, from tens of thousands of years ago, it's all done with ochres, um, white ochre, yellow ochre, red ochre. And so she wrote a chapter on, on ochres. And so uh, it's a great book. It's just kind of a story of her travels, but it's focused on pigments and color, which is really kind of fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think this model is not unique to art. It's, it's, I mean, you can apply it all over the place. In fact, I'm giving a talk at Goldman Sachs in a week or so on this exact same topic. Um, so, you know, the financial community is interested in doing things like this, too. So I, I, think, I don't think it matters what the discipline is. It's just a matter of what, what is the topic, right? And so the idea of, of, of leveraging, you know, various different disciplines um, applies to everything. And, um, you know, if you, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it, it's really easy to get in a mindset of, it's really hard to collaborate. For example, I, I couldn't collaborate with the dance department, right? And I remember when I first got here, I tried to draw a map showing, you know, how our college was connected, um, how all the departments are connected. And then I tried to draw a map for myself to show how our college is connected with all the other colleges. And as I was going through this process, I talked to lots of people and I came to the dance department. Right? It's like, okay, how on earth can my college collaborate with the dance department? Um, it turns out that we can, and it turns out we, we, we're trying. So one of our faculty um, who studies glass has had conversations with the dance department. And glass is an amorphous material. In other words, the atoms are all randomly arranged. Um, but if you heat glass up, it'll order itself and crystallize. And if you think about dance, dance can be chaotic or it can be ordered, right? Or if you think about a marching band, Marching bands can be disordered or they can be organized. And so it's just an interesting way to look at, you know, dance and crystallization processes and bring them together. And I can't tell you more about what she was doing. Um, Krista Carlson's her name, she was working on this. Um, but um, you could pick, I think, almost any two disciplines and find a way to connect them. Um, and I, 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 I like to think of an analogy. I remember watching, it was Johnny Carson years ago, had this uh, show where, uh, he went around and um, had people eat sandwiches, and he said, pick any cheese, pick any jelly, pick any bread, put them together, we'll, we'll um, grill it, and it'll be delicious, right? <laughs> and so it sounds like a really odd thing, but um, so, and they, did the, they went around and did this uh, experiment with people all over the city, and it turned out that any three ingredients you put together was delicious. And so I think there's some truth to that in science and, and other disciplines. If you actually bring people together, something can happen no matter what. So I don't think you'll ever find, it's, I think it's really hard to find two disciplines that you, two or three disciplines you couldn't bring together and do something better by bringing them together. So the sandwich analogy might not be great, but, but you have to try it. It actually, it's true. <laughs> other questions? Yeah, so this was meant to just stimulate some discussion about this idea, and, and we've been talking about maybe getting something going in some field of conservation or, or restoration um, or, or art and cultural heritage. Um, there is a new grant, the Mellon Foundation grant. Is, who's the leader of that? Is, is she still here? Um, 
but um, and that's a, a, a great opportunity for us to bring um, museums on campus and, and technical folks and librarians together uh, to do something really interdisciplinary. So these things are kind of starting on campus and, and hopefully will continue. So. With that, we very much want to thank Daryl Butt for bringing us all together today. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.